Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Got a pet that itches, bites, scratch, chews, licks, or just putts with itself all the time? You'd swear it doesn't have fleas. You've tried lotions, potions, and shampoos. Your veterinarian just gives you pills and pokes your pet with injections of who knows what, and the skin issues persist. The answer must be in the diet. At least, that's what all the pet parents at the dog park and the pet store sales folks are telling you. So, does your pet have a food allergy? Is grain and gluten-free the answer? Or should you feed organic, holistic, or maybe raw? My guest is Dr. Alice Jerriman, a pharmacist, a board-certified veterinary dermatologist, adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University College of Medicine, international lecturer and author. We'll be right back after this short break and she'll tell us all about itchy bites and food. Stay tuned. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite for life. Pick up two tubes of Doggo Suds. Get the third tube free. Peppermint, tea tree, lavender, Doggo Suds shampoo. Made with all natural coconut, jojoba, aloe. Great for healthy skin and soft, shiny coats. But no itchy, harsh chemicals. Lather up, rinse away. Try Doggo Suds. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Dr. Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us today. This is a topic that I run into almost every day in my practice in Southern California. So you being a dermatologist, you must be the expert, definitely. Well, I don't know about that, but I would agree with you that I run to, into this topic on a daily basis because there's so much blogging about food that's not evidence-based fact. And that's what I thought we'd do today is try to get some of the facts out there about food allergy so that we can kind of steer our patients, our clients, uh, actually, into selecting and perhaps even discussing with their own veterinarian, could my dog or cat be food allergic and what do I do about it? So there truly is a food allergy, and then I understand there's food sensitivities. What's the difference? Well, yes, you're right. There's the food allergy is immunologically based, which anyone dealing with immunology knows that that changes on a day-to-day basis. Food sensitivity or food intolerance is more along the line of lactose intolerance, people that are, if they eat too much soy, they get bloated, that kind of thing. Whereas a food allergy is actually a more systemic reaction that can affect other parts of the body besides the gastrointestinal tract. So with food allergies, I remember when I was in veterinary school that they said, oh, that was always something that started as a young pet, cats or dogs. Is that true? Because it seems as though I'm seeing pets that are older that also, in my mind, have a food allergy. Right. A food allergy can actually set in at any age. The majority of dogs and cats with food allergies start very young when the gastrointestinal immune system is developing, but because it's a sensitization process, it can take place over several years that you become sensitized to a protein that you've become allergic to and not show up in a dog, say, till five, six, seven, eight years of age. If there's not a real age-related incidence of food allergy, it can occur at any age. And even something they've been eating for years, is that correct? It sounds like since it takes a while for it to build up, that would make sense. Right, and, and I often hear that. Well, how can he be food allergic? He's been eating the same food for all these years. And that's exactly the thing that's taking place, that sensitization. 
I tell clients that, you know, as I get older, there's certain foods that I can't eat now that I used to eat, and it's the same way with our pets. Hmm. The skin, being the largest organ of the body, has such a limited way of responding to insults. So how is a pet owner, how is a veterinarian supposed to know what's causing this skin breakout? What's the itching, the biting, the scratching? Are there signs that are very characteristic of having a food allergy? Very good question, because no two pets are the same with food allergy. It can affect every organ of the body. Dogs and cats can have ear infections. It can only be one ear that's involved as opposed to both ears. They can lick their feet. They can rub their little butts. Some of them just result in breakouts of bacterial infection. And even more serious things like 10% of food allergic dogs can present with seizures. So, it's, yes, it's skin and gut related, but it can even go beyond that. I always tell people food allergy in pets can be responsible for a lot more than what you think. Even some immune-mediated diseases called, such as pemphigus. But in the majority of food allergic patients we see, it's usually skin with 50% of those having gut problems, like they go to the bathroom five, six, seven, eight times a day with bowel movements. I mean, that's not normal for anyone. And a lot of dog gas or flatulence, that kind of thing. You know, when you have something like that, that is not normal. So you're not either digesting your food right or you're having a food allergy to what one of the proteins that are in the food you're eating. And the other thing is it's all year round because you're eating the same food every day. So you don't just present with food allergy, you know, in the spring and be fine the rest of the seasons of the year. It's a non-seasonal occurrence. I think it is just so frustrating for veterinarians as well as pet owners because clients will come in and say, oh, okay, I've changed the diet a couple of times. Now I'm feeding this new food and it's really, really expensive. So expensive food, does quality make a difference if you have a food sensitivity? Well, not so much. What we want to do is ask the owner, what has the pet eaten before? What proteins have you fed? corn, wheat, egg, beef, chicken, soy, dairy, lamb, if he's eaten any one of those, we need to avoid those. And we need to use a novel protein, something the pet has never eaten before, like venison, rabbit, duck. There's going to be a new one coming out, alligator. And having said that, it's, okay, yes, one of those novel proteins, but without any of the other ingredients to which that pet has eaten before. And unfortunately, the only commercial foods besides cooking for the pet that fit that criteria are prescription diets, which are actually tested during their manufacture and at the end of the batch to be sure there's no contaminant proteins in those foods. So, you know, if they're looking for, say, okay, my dog's never eaten venison, and they go and they get an over-the-counter venison diet, unfortunately, those diets have shown to have other proteins in them, such as soy, poultry, and beef. So limited ingredient over-the-counter diets, unfortunately, are not qualified to be used as a food trial, which is how we diagnose food allergy. Mm, Definitely want to get into food. And as you're saying right now, I think it is so interesting because when you get a, a carton of ice cream, all right, it's ice cream and it's vanilla. So you know you're allergic to nuts and there's no nuts in it because it's vanilla. But when you read the label, it says produced in a plant that handles tree nuts. It's like, oh, so some people, some pets are that sensitive, correct me if I'm wrong, that just even having the dust in the air can set them off. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, and, And interestingly enough, in humans, they think that we develop food allergies by food particles actually being free in the household, hanging out, if you will, with house dust and house dust mite. There's some evidence to show that may be true in pets as well. Ah, This sounds frustrating. So with all of these things that can affect a pet allergy-wise, are there certain breeds of dogs and cats that are the most sensitive? You know, I think a lot about West Highland Whites and Sharpays coming through the door of having skin issues. But what are you seeing? Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. We also see a lot of Labrador Retrievers, German Shepherds. As far as cats, Siamese tend to be more food allergic than, say, you know, Bengals and and other types of domestic short hair cats. The problem is with inhalant allergy, which, if you will, grass allergy, that can show up with the same symptoms as food allergy. So it's difficult in these 
quote-unquote allergic pets to decipher how much of this is food-related and how much of this could be inhalant allergy because they both interreact, if you will. There's some cross-reactivity between foods and pollens. So it's extremely frustrating as a, as a veterinarian because here you've, you've got a pet, say a West Highland Terrier, that's grass allergic, but how much of that could be food-related so you really want to do a good prescription hypoallergenic diet with that pet because, believe it or not, that can lessen some of the symptoms of their grass allergy now that we know that these things are related, pollens and foods. So, Dr. Jerome, and I live in Southern California, practice here, and we're very fortunate to have great weather year-round. So I see some of these pets coming in, and yes, they have their year-round itchies. So it's like, is this allergies Is to food, or is this going to be inhaled? So I have to really look at both of these now as being concomitant, as they say, fancy term comorbidities, both may be causing issues. Yes, you do. And the interesting thing is it's pretty easy for an allergist to skin or blood test for inhalant allergy, trees, weeds, grasses, dust, mite, mold. But with food allergy, there's no valid skin or blood test for that. So they have to be either on a home-cooked, supervised by their veterinarian diet or a prescription hypoallergenic diet for literally 8 to 10 weeks because what a pet eats today can actually take two weeks to get out of their system as far as the protein utilization. So the frustrating thing is I won't know if a patient's food allergic for, say, 8 to 10 weeks, which if I skin or blood test that patient for outdoor and indoor allergens, I'll know within a day or two. So it's frustrating for owners to have to hang on that long for 8 to 10 weeks. You know, we're in a society where we want instant results and we want that pet better by tomorrow, so it's hard to hang on for an 8 to 10 week diet. But what I tell owners is, look, if I can manage your pet with food and not so much medicine, how fabulous is that? Mm, Great. With the food, I love that you brought up the food allergy testing. We're familiar with having as I, as a child, had a lot of allergies myself and had the injections under the skin, which didn't feel wonderful, but they said, okay, I'm allergic to cats and dogs. So, of course, I became a veterinarian. But with regard to food, I know there are panels, different companies that veterinarians can send in blood samples or clients can go online and go, oh, take a little cheek swab, send it in, and we're going to tell you what your pet's allergic to. Why doesn't that work? Well, in veterinary medicine, there's not much evidence to show that that's valid. And it doesn't work theoretically because those blood tests measure something called IgE, which forms against a particular allergen that you're allergic to. And unfortunately, there's more to do with food allergy than just IgE. It can also involve something called cell-mediated immunity, and blood tests do not measure for that. So, hence, we have to do that 8- to 10-week diet trial of hypoallergenic diets. You know, in my practice, I I think you could talk to any dermatologist slash allergist. We wish we had a blood test for food allergy. It would make our lives so much easier. And the other issue is you can put a pet on one elimination diet, and they may not do that great, and so you have to suggest a different one. And there's, you know, there's another 8- to 10-week course of a different hypoallergenic diet. So we like to be able to hit it right the first time by doing a good dietary history and finding out, let's start a diet with this novel protein because your pet has never eaten this before. That's actually a very difficult thing to do because there's one study of 150 pet foods showing that 83% of them didn't have in them what it said it did on the label. So if you're a label reader and you're being very careful, oh, I want to feed a diet without chicken, I doubt it. You're going to find one without chicken if 83% of foods tested show there's other ingredients in there besides what's on the label. That's why the prescription diets, which are held to a higher standard, seem to suffice better for food trials. We keep talking about these, you know, chicken may be a causative food allergen here in the United States. What are, again, some of the most common food allergens in dogs and cats, and is it the same in every country? No, it isn't the same in every country. If we're looking at England or Australia, mutton is fed a lot to pets there. So that's a common allergen. In dogs in the U.S., though, it's usually beef, dairy, wheat, eggs, or chicken. 
are the most common food allergens, and in cats, uh, beef, fish, or chicken. What you'll notice there is it's the protein, not the grains, that we have a problem with. You know, grain-free, it does not mean hypoallergenic. That's a, a, a common misunderstanding, if you will. Dogs and cats tend to react to proteins with their food allergy, not grains. So why is it just a matter of marketing that all these foods are, oh, they're grain-free, so they must be better? You know, I hear that as you hear it too every day consistently. Well, it can't be this food because it's a grain-free food, and I'm paying $50 for this little itty-bitty bag of food. Right. Yeah, and the other thing about grain-free is it's not low in calories because there's other substitutes put in there like pea, starch, tapioca, and there can be quite a good weight gain on some of those grain-free diets. Um, And also, I think it's at UC Davis, there's some research going on showing that Newfoundlands and Golden Retrievers, they're starting to see with a particular type of heart disease that may be due to grain-free diets. So that's an ongoing research study right now. Grain-free seems to be a marketing ploy. There's really no evidence-based facts behind it. Well, it's great advertising. People have really caught on to it, but alas, it doesn't seem to be the answer for them. Also talking about those really expensive foods that people are buying, and it says, oh, it's human grade, so this must be a good food, and there are no meat byproducts. That's one of the things I love chatting with people about. It's like, okay, what is the meat byproduct? And it's not necessarily bad. Please discuss that. Well, meat byproducts are, you know, the bones, uh, some of the organs, that kind of thing that aren't used in human foods. So they take that and they grind it up, and it's considered a protein source. And, you know, AFCO, which is the governing body of what's in food as far as ingredients, fatty acids, protein, carbohydrate, fat, that kind of thing, they require a certain amount of protein, a minimum amount. So when you have meat byproducts, it's actually organ meat plus skeletal meat that's ground up to meet that protein requirement. And there's really nothing wrong with that. Um, In some of these foods where it's whole meat, remember, whole meat holds in a lot of water. So then you'll see the next ingredient will be some sort of carbohydrate because you want to boost up that, if you will, the weight of that food and not only that but the calorie count. So human grade, and I wanted to mention that to address that, which you had mentioned, that now just became defined at the 2016 AFCO meeting because there was no definition for human grade prior to that. You could use that as much as you wanted, just like you could use the word holistic. There's no AFCO definition for that. Unfortunately, there is one company that did sue the state of Ohio to use the words human grade, and they won because of they were claiming lack of freedom of speech. So finally, AFCO did define the words human grade, and now you actually have to meet certain requirements. So this sounds interesting, difficult, and at times frustrating to try to feed our pets a diet that's going to do well for them. I'd love to chat with you right after you take the short break about you were mentioning elimination diets, how they're actually conducted, what we can use what you can expect, and what you shouldn't feed with these novel protein diets. So I'm chatting right now with Dr. Alice German. She is a board-certified veterinary dermatologist and pharmacologist. She is just the perfect expert for this particular topic. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. What if you could protect the life of your cat with something so simple and affordable that you already use every day? Get ready for the evolution of kitty litter. It's Pretty Litter. Along with all the features you've come to expect from your kitty litter, Pretty Litter's patented and scientific formula will also monitor your cat's health and detect illnesses early while providing industry-leading odor control. Two kitty litters, same cat, same price. But there's one important difference. Pretty Litter reacts to your cat's waste by detecting health issues simply by changing color. And the key is that Pretty Litter detects these issues before your cat shows symptoms of physical illness or pain, likely saving you major dollars in vet bills while protecting the health of your cat. What do you think, little guy? Ready to switch litter? 
Pretty Litter. Colorful insight into your cat's health. Go to prettylittercats.com forward slash cat 101 or use coupon code cat 101 to get 20% off your first subscription order. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Dr. Jeroman, you've yes. been talking about having pets on an elimination diet. So many of our dogs and cats really like their particular food, and trying to change it or trying to change a pet parent's idea of what they want to feed isn't always the easiest. I'd love to have you talk a little bit about what an elimination diet is. You've mentioned how long it needs to go on, about 8 to 10 weeks. What can you feed? What can't you feed while you're doing this? Very good question. And it's really difficult for some clients to feed an elimination diet. The definition of which is a protein that pet has never been exposed to. And remember, in most over-the-counter pet foods, Corn, wheat, egg, beef, chicken, soy, dairy, and lamb are the most common in the United States proteins in over-the-counter pet foods. So we need to get them off of all of those and onto a novel protein, duck, venison, rabbit, gator, which is actually coming out in the next few weeks. To do that, we either have the owner cook for the pet or use a prescription hypoallergenic diet made by one of three companies because Like I mentioned before, in the -the over-the-counter diets that say limited ingredient, those have been found to have other proteins in them, particularly soy, poultry, and beef, whereas the prescription diets are actually DNA tested, which is an expensive test, which leads to the higher price of those foods to be sure there's none of those contaminant proteins in there. Unfortunately, they are a little more expensive, but... To be honest, as I said before, if I can control that pet on food and no or little medicine, you're actually money ahead. When you start this hypoallergenic diet, you have to wean them onto it over a week, mixing it with their current food. You can't abruptly change the diet, you know, stop the -the over-the-counter diet today and start the prescription diet the, the next day because they can have some GI upset. And while they're on this food for 8 to 10 weeks if they're a dog, 4 to 6 weeks if you're a cat, They can't have any treats, bones, rawhides, beef-flavored heartworm preventative. We have to cut that all out. They can't have a milk bone from the UPS man. One fault can actually set you back two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because the people, the clients that own, or I shouldn't say own, that have food allergic children really understand this, and they do a great job with their dogs on hypoallergenic diets. I think a lot of us think that our dogs are suffering on a hypoallergenic diet because they're not going to get that milk bone. But they do very well with the diet, and you can use the diet as treats, or I'll let our clients use fruits and veggies, just no corn, popcorn, grapes, or raisins as a little bit of a treat. But one little treat that's not approved on this diet can actually set them back two weeks. And you don't want to do that when you've got to do an 8- to 10-week diet trial. You want to get it done right the first time. So you really have to be very stringent about what they're eating, what they're exposed to. I've heard of even pets that had flavored toothpaste, and they reacted to that. So you just really need to cut everything out. You keep talking about hypoallergenic diets. I believe that you're talking about the hydrolyzed diet. Is that correct? Well, there's two types of hypoallergenic diets. The hydrolyzed protein, which the two examples we have of that, prescription diets in veterinary medicine, are either soy or chicken-based, and why the pet doesn't react to those are because the lab kind of got a hold of those foods and cut up those little soy pieces and chicken pieces into teeny tiny little pieces so the body doesn't recognize them as soy or chicken anymore. And then the other type of hypoallergenic diet is what we call a novel protein diet, the duck, rabbit, kangaroo, alligator, or venison. So there's actually two types of hypoallergenic diets, hydrolyzed protein and novel protein. So just somebody going to the pet store again because you're saying, oh, if it's a duck base, I can go to the pet store and I can find a food that says it has, it's a duck flavored food or it's a duck based food. But again, you're saying that those foods oftentimes have 
some chicken in it, have some wheat, even if it's not listed on the label. I think that's what really tricks a lot of people. Yes. One of the boarded veterinary nutritionists, along with one of our dermatologists, took uh, four over-the-counter venison-based diets, and they took a cup of each, and they sent it to the lab for DNA analysis. And then they took a cup of one of the prescription venison and potato diets and sent that along to the lab. And these diets were blinded, and they said, you know, tell us what's in this food. Well, the prescription venison potato was venison and potato. And the four over-the-counter venison limited ingredient diets had soy, poultry, and beef in the food not listed on the label. And if you talk to those companies who manufacture that, they said, well, our intention was never to make this a hypoallergenic diet. We're just calling it limited ingredient. So apparently there's a little differentiation there. But you will not find an adequate hypoallergenic diet over the counter because it's not so much the duck or the venison that's in the -the over-the-counter diet, it's what's not in it that makes the big difference. Now, is there a, a truth to it? I had a client who said that she could not feed a diet that had any type of a feathered protein. So if it was quail or chicken or duck or turkey or whatever, if that started life with feathers on it, her pet couldn't eat it. Okay, that's true. There's some cross-reactivity between poultry, and I think what's more interesting, there's a lot of cross-reactivity between chicken and egg, which, you know, who would think that? I guess chickens lay eggs, but you don't think of that. There's also some cross-reactivity between fish and chicken. So you can get very minute in all of this, but as far as as what we can do, we can only do what we can do. We want to use the, the most purest, form of that protein without anything else in there. Now, I have some, I'm practicing in Ohio, so there's a lot of deer hunting that goes on in Ohio, and I'll have clients say to me, well, I've got a freezer full of venison. Can you give me a recipe for a, a nutritionally complete cooked hypoallergenic diet for the next eight to ten weeks? And I'm happy to do that as long as, you know, we've got one carb and one protein and that's it. And they'll take a, a vitamin mineral supplement, you know, for that duration as well. So, yeah, there is a lot of cross-reactivity. The problem is with your client saying about the feathered, and I believe that so much, but if she's going then to get an over-the-counter diet, I guarantee you she can get what looks like a beef-based diet, but I guarantee you there's other proteins in that diet. I can't tell you how much, but there will be because of that one uh, 83% of 150 pet foods tested, over-the-counter pet foods that show there's other ingredients in those foods not listed on the label. Dr. Jeroman, so many people want to feed as natural a diet as possible. And again, looking at labels, you know, these pet foods, oh, they're natural, what the pet would eat in the wild. But our domesticated animals and their wild ancestors seem to be so different in what their nutritional requirements were. Is there a correlation? Can they be basically eating that wild diet, and should they be eating a raw diet? Well, you know, thankfully, our pets have evolved since, you know, wolves have been out there in primitive times. The problem with an all-meat diet, which is pretty much what they used to eat, now our domesticated dogs can digest carbs, whereas back in primeval days, they couldn't. you got to remember, the wild is not a fun place to be. Those dogs had a lifespan of only two or three years. I mean, they're eating fresh kill, eating the entire thyroid gland of the fresh killed, whatever pet what the animal was, and also the bones. You get stomach perforation by those bones. So living in the wild was about two to three years of age, and that's it. You know, we want all our pets to live 14, 15, 16 years of age, and thankfully we've made so many strides with all these Ph.D. nutritionists studying everything that these pets need. For example, the taurine issue that we mentioned earlier about causing heart disease in some of golden retrievers in Newfoundland. They're really on that, investigating that. The issue with uh, the raw diets is there's no long-term study to show that those are nutritionally complete. And that's my concern. Certain raw diets will function as a hypoallergenic diet. And some dogs will improve on those. But my worry is is that nutritionally complete for that dog long term? So that needs to be discussed with with your veterinarian if you're going to go that route. 
I personally would rather go a route where I've seen boarded nutritionists actually do evidence-based studies on prescription diets or veterinary therapeutic diets, if you want to refer to them that way, to show that it, they can inspire longevity in our pets. I'm always concerned about contamination. You know, we know that when you're working with chicken, you're preparing chicken for your family at home and you have that raw chicken, you're supposed to have different even cutting boards to work with this and wash your hands because of contamination. Now, we keep hearing so many of these raw diets are being recalled because of contamination. Does raw diet versus freeze-dried make a difference? Does freeze-dry make it safer? Well, from what I've read and talked to uh, some nutritionists about, they're not real sure as far as what is the actual temperature that we need, what is the actual freeze-dried temperature that we need to kill off Campylobacter, Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella, all the things that can contaminate these diets. I tell my clients that, listen, if you've got an infant in the house, if you've got a person that doesn't have a great immunity, like an older parent that's living with you or someone who has cancer on chemotherapy, you can't have a pet that's on a raw diet in that household because it's proven they can shed salmonella. There's certain vet schools that will not allow a raw diet fed pet in that veterinary hospital. And if they have to be hospitalized, they're hospitalized in a different area. Some guide dogs that um, go into children's hospitals, they're not allowed in there if they're fed a raw diet. So there are concerns with handling these diets and also exposing immunocompromised people, be it the very, very young or the very, very old, to dogs that are on raw diet. So if you really have to feed a raw diet to your pet because this just speaks to your soul, it sounds like you just need to be so extremely careful. And is if you make the diet yourself, is that any better? Well, no, in the sense that you've got to wash your hands after handling the food. You have to sterilize the food bowls. I mean, you can't, you know, some of us, when we feed our pets, we're busy in the morning, we feed them, we take the food bowl up, oh, I'll wash it out when I come back home tonight. Well, yeah, you've got to sterilize those food bowls. You can't leave residual food in those bowls. The other thing is if you've got infants that are crawling around the floor and kissing the dog, that kind of thing, it's just at this point the safety factor just is not there. So if somebody says, all right, I'm not going to do raw, but I really want to home cook. I want to know what's going into my pet's mouth and into its body. Is there a way to safely, nutritiously feed your pet? a home-cooked diet because you look at what goes into these commercial-made foods like, oh my goodness, how can I replicate the amount of protein and carbohydrates? I just can't give them a little bit of fruits and veggies and some meat and say it's balanced. How should they go about doing that? Right. I agree. There was one study that showed 60% of home-cooked diets were nutritionally incomplete and the biggest error was the calcium-phosphorus ratio. An all-meat diet makes you calcium deficient. You get osteoporosis. You get low vitamin A levels. There's a a very nice website, balanceit.com. It's run by board-certified veterinary nutritionists at UC Davis. It's free, and it's really kind of fun to maneuver. If you get someone that wants to home cook for their pet, you go into balanceit.com, you put your pet's weight, you pick what disease it has. Okay, say it doesn't have a disease. You just... You know, I want to cook for my pet. I want to know what's going into their body. I love that idea. You pull up balanceit.com. You pick from the, okay, I want to do um, tofu protein or I want to do beef as a protein. There's just a whole list. And you check that. Then you go into the carb side and there's things like quinoa or corn or oats, anything like that. And you check that and then you put your pet's weight in and then they give you a printout of how much protein versus carb versus, say, canola oil or corn oil or safflower oil. And then they also sell a plant-based supplement called Balanced Supplement, which has all the vitamins and minerals. I think it's fabulous. If your dog has kidney disease, if it's food allergic, there's also columns for that as well. So in my clients that want to cook for their pet, I tell them balanceit.com. If you have any trouble with the website, I'll be happy to go on it for you and get you a couple different recipes. I love it. And it's good to know that my patients are getting the correct nutritionally balanced diet as opposed to, well, I'll just give them, you know, a pound of this and throw some rice in. I mean, that's 
totally incorrect. Long-term, not good. So balanceit.com, it's, it's a free, valuable source, and I just love it. And it's for dogs as well as cats, because I know cats trying to put them on an elimination diet, a novel protein diet, can be stressful. And dangerous, because, of, you know, you're not supplementing with taurine. So, yes, it, it cats as well. Fabulous. Well, I have had a great learning experience, and hopefully all my listeners have also. We've been listening to Dr. Alice Jeroman, a board-certified veterinary dermatologist, adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University College of Medicine, international lecturer, author, and I can tell very much a pet lover. If you have any questions that you want answered, please drop me a line. You can drop it to the pet doctor at petliferadio.com. I'll see if I can find these specialists that can answer those questions for us. You can also follow me on Facebook at Dr. Cruz N Pets and Twitter at Cruz and Pets. So looking forward to hearing more from you, things that are concerning you. So this is Dr. Bernadine Cruz with the Pet Doctor. Please tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you that best possible pet owner. Have a great week. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.